Okay, folks, we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Sue Stringer, and I manage the agritourism program for the Kansas Department of Wildlife, Parks, and Tourism. Thank you all for gathering with us virtually this evening to discuss safe practices in your agritourism businesses this fall and winter. We know all our businesses that have been running this summer, like the UPIC and produce sales, ha and have gone forward with their operations with online ordering, car delivery, uh, farmers markets, or et cetera. And we thank you all for what you've done to keep your staff and your consumers safe. This evening, we have partnered with the Kansas Department of Health and Environment, the Kansas Department of Agriculture, and the Kansas Department of Agriculture, and then one of our agritourism businesses to share ideas and recommendations for inviting guests onto your farm and ranch in a safe and friendly manner. I was have to say, as I was preparing for my slides tonight, uh, the song from my younger days came to my mind of signs, signs everywhere there's signs, because that's kind of how we are trying to manage COVID in a safe manner um, and hope that people do read and pay attention to our signs. I know I've heard from some of you that, yeah, you can have all the signs you want, but people don't pay any attention to them. But that was just what came to my head tonight. Um, we have seen certainly a lot of them, uh, and those will be included in some of our suggestions for this evening. Again, thank you time, for taking the time to participate tonight, and we do want this to be as interactive as possible. I did see in the chat a question uh, saying that they could not see themselves. Tonight's meeting, uh, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A or in the chat box, or we will give you the opportunity to go live, though you won't see your face on the screen, uh, after Ashley's presentation, and then again at the end, so we can have some type of virtual online discussion. Uh, and since you folks can't see each other, uh, you are more than welcome to enter your name and your business name in the chat box, so that others know who all is uh, attending this meeting. So I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items before we start. Um, during this presentation, uh, this portion of the web webinar, uh, everyone's microphones will be muted. I will let each speaker tell you a little bit more about themselves rather than me including their bio and in their intro in the introductions. If you have questions during the presentation, please submit your questions using the chat option on the screen again or wait until we go uh, open it up for live and, and our wonderful IT guy from Department of Ag will unmute you if you can't figure out where the mute button is or mute you if too much noise is going on. Uh, we will monitor the written questions and comments and if at any time during this meeting when asking a question please include your name, uh, your business and where you're from. This meeting is being recorded and will be posted online with a link on the travel industry page at travelks.com and, and the From the Land of Kansas page under Discover Resources. So I'd like to introduce you to our first presenter, who is Ashley Gose, the Deputy, Secretary, Deputy Secretary with the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. Ashley, please give some information about yourself. Your agriculture background would be great too. Uh, your education, what you do for your agency, and then just go ahead and launch into your presentation. Thank you, Ashley, for attending. Thank you, Sue. Good evening to all of you. Um, I hope you are enjoying a nice, cool evening. I'm happy to be here to share some tips with you on having um, safe practices over the next um, seasons. So I do want to start off before I forget for any Christmas tree farmers who are on this call, I did not leave you off on purpose, but everything I'm going to um, present tonight applies to you as well. So didn't do it on purpose, I promise. So anyway, I'm Ashley Goss. I'm the Deputy Secretary of the Kansas Department of Health and Environment, which um, means that I oversee the entire Division of Health. Um, I have just over 300 staff that work in our division. Um, we are one of three divisions of the agency. We have environment, and then we also have the Division of Healthcare Finance, um, known as Medicaid. 
Um, so, and currently with COVID, I serve as the incident commander. So um, pretty much all I do right now is COVID. So um, hopefully you don't ask me anything that I can't answer. Um, but of course, if you do, I will be more than happy to get the answer for you. Um, I am from Southwest Kansas, actually. I moved to Topeka, Kansas five years ago. Um, my husband and I are both born and raised in Southwest Kansas. We both grew up on farms. Our parents farmed um, and, they, and they still farm. Um, my in-laws had a very large hog farm um, and now they have greatly reduced and have mostly um, crops, no longer have hogs. My family had a crop farm. So I'm a farm kid. Um, love it. I, I miss I miss a lot of it, but um, we chose to move here five years ago when our kids all went to college. I have one kid at home still who, who is 14, um, and the rest have gone to school, graduated, and have either gotten married, had kids, or are just enjoying life. So I do have a master's degree in business administration with an emphasis in healthcare administration. Um, when I was in Southwest Kansas, I'm actually from Garden City. Um, I did serve as the health department director for six years prior to moving to Topeka, uh, and I was with the health department for actual 11 years at the local level. So I feel like that's provided some insight in regard to this work. Um, never did I think we would be in a pandemic um, at all. So um, I think it, it helps to know what it's like to be boots on the ground, and that helps to be at the state level and knowing what the locals are going through. So. I think I covered everything that you asked me to, Sue, so I will jump into my presentation. So next slide. So just a really brief overview of COVID. I'm sure um, you guys have heard plenty about it and like many people um, are, are, are tired of it. I, I can't say I disagree with that. I'm ready for it to go away. Um, so just basic general information in case you don't know, COVID-19 is considered um, to be a respiratory disease, which means it is spread through droplets, which is why it's a uh, very important that you wear a mask. Um, it, so far, that's the, the best way to prove, to slow the spread of COVID-19 is by wearing a mask, social distancing, um, avoid congregate settings, all the things that you keep hearing about and all the things that um, really put a damper on what we're used to doing, unfortunately. Um, is in regard to a vaccine, um, I do want to assure you that our team um, at the state, at KDHE, has been actively planning for um, several months now on what to do um, once we do get a vaccine for this um, and how we will get it um, shipped, dispensed across the state of Kansas. And we've already been discussing priority groups, working with the feds, all the things. The one piece of information I don't have for you, and I wish I did, is when are we going to have a vaccine? Your guess is as good as mine right now. We will keep you updated, of course. Check our website often. Tune into our uh, our once a week uh, media updates, both with the governor and uh, Dr. Norman. Next slide. So let's start off with some general guidance for any location that's open during the COVID outbreak. And again, Christmas tree farmers, I, you're included in all of this information. Um, if I have my way, we won't have COVID at Christmas, but I think I'm going to lose that. So I'm super sorry. So be very clear about where people should enter and what path they should take one-way flow of traffic is helpful in reducing contact among people. So think about stores that you've been going into that have the arrows on the ground, have one door for entrance, one door for exit. Think that way. I realize a lot of your operations are outside, but if you have people put traffic walking in, it's very important that you think of that. Consider re requiring people to sign up for an appointment time to visit to avoid having too many people in your facility at once. Be cognizant of mass gathering limitations set by your county. As you all know, the, the, the counties each have done their own thing as far as how many people are allowed at events, things like that. So be sure and check that guidance before you uh, move forward. Um, and whether it's the number of people or percentage of capacity, it, each county is a little bit different. So check with your county. Don't host events or have attractions that cause groups of people to gather like live concerts, demonstrations, or kid, uh, children's activities. Next slide, please. Be sure that you keep your staff and patrons safe with good cleaning practices. So require that all staff and patrons wear a face mask or a face covering at all times. Face coverings should cover both the nose and the mouth and not leave any open areas around the face. Require everyone to use hand sanitizer and wash their hands upon entering. Um, you can have hand sanitizer at the be beginning of your farm. Uh, wherever people are gonna be out of their vehicles and actually moving to participate in your activities, have a hand sanitizer. 
have stations set up around the facility also to encourage uh, hand hygiene. And also make sure that you're aware of the FDA's recall list of hand sanitizers as well. There are a few of them listed. If you're a location like an apple orchard or a berry farm, do not let customers sample the food on site. Make sure they pick whatever they pick, they take it home and enjoy it. So don't have free samples sitting around um, with everyone grabbing from the, same, from the same plate, not a good idea. Also, if you can, encourage cash transactions whenever possible to reduce the amount of direct contact between staff and customers. Next slide, please. So let's look specifically at your staff and workforce. Make sure that they know your expectations ahead of time for staff and patron behavior and have the chance to allow them to ask questions, of course. We would recommend that you screen each employee before they start their shift for symptoms. Now, for those of you that have a small family operation, you're all in the same household, it's a little bit of a different situation. I would hope that um, if someone isn't feeling well, they won't work. Um, we have a form on our website, though, that you can use if you have staff that you want to screen. It goes over the questions you should be asking them. Um, and then we, you can also use an infrared thermometer to take their temperature. Um, just keep in mind that the outside weather, the, the temperature outside will affect the reading on the thermometer. Have staff do one task or stick to one area of the facility to keep social distancing from others. And if at all possible, avoid having staff do multiple tasks that might result in cross-contamination. Next slide, please. If you serve food or you choose, if you serve food or choose to have employees use gloves, be sure your employees are trained in the proper use of gloves. So the proper donning and doffing of them they should know how to put the gloves on and off while limiting contamination of other services. And they should be reminded periodically that gloves, that glove use does not take the place of hand hygiene. Employees should wash their hands before putting gloves on when switching pairs of gloves and after touching their face, eating, using the bathroom, or any other time gloves or hands have been contaminated. Make sure that all your employees know how to refill the hand sanitizer, hand soap stations, and have the stations checked frequently to make sure they're not empty. And if at all possible, stagger your staff's lunch and break times to avoid having a group of staff gather in a break room or, or in close contact groups outside. Next slide, please. So for those of you that actually have a retail space at your establishment, you wanna make sure you take precautions since this is a spot where people might gather, especially if it's indoor. So the indoor spaces where we really get concerned about the disease being able to be spread easier. So make sure that you have signs to tell your patrons which way to come in and which way to exit. Keep them separate if at all possible. Where they should wait in line, make sure and mark the floor if you can um, at six fit intervals. Again, you see this at a lot of the retail stores um, around that have done a really good job at this. They've put arrows out, things like that. If you have more than one cash register or checkout stand, make sure they are separated enough to keep people six feet apart at all times. And if you are able to, and you can also install a plexiglass barrier that keeps your customers and your staff separate. Consider having pre-picked and pre-packaged items available for easy purchase to minimize the amount of time people are in the retail space. If you can have customers purchase ahead of time, you could have a separate pickup window. I think of pickup windows or a separate pickup aisle outside. Next slide, please. Additionally, if you are able to have two staff members handle the product um, and money, so germs from cash aren't transferred to the product. If you have the option to move a retail space outside, perhaps under a tent, having increased airflow is great. That will keep everything moving. If not, if you can open the doors and windows, if you have them in an inside building, that would be terrific. Next slide, please. As far as cleaning and sanitizing goes, the EPA's website is a great resource to ensure that the cleaning products you are using are effective for SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. Um, the list is available if you do a Google search. It's, it's super easy, but the good thing so far about this virus is that it's, it's normal cleaning items that are effective. So your Clorox wipes, your Lysol wipes, your alcohol-based cleaners um, are all effective, but they have a great list on their website. And also make sure that any items that are shared, like baskets, buckets, wheelbarrows, make sure that you sanitize those in between uses between customers. Um, frequently, 
Frequently touched surfaces like doorknobs, handrails, again, wipe those down frequently throughout the day. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, we put together guidance specifically for pumpkin patches, apple orchards, um, berry farms, you pick farms, and of course, Christmas tree farms. And I apologize, let me let my dog out. Was not expecting that. The dog knows when the husband arrives. I apologize for that. Okay, in regard to these, make sure you tell customers where to start, have them go one direction, down an aisle to encourage the one-way flow of traffic. Again, as indicated earlier, have a specific direction so that you don't have people coming face-to-face -face is the point to that. If your rows are closer than six feet, stagger where customers pick and only use every other row if needed. Make sure that the exit for the field is different from the entrance and mark each one clearly. If possible, also have signage and staff available to ensure that there are no groups of crowds gathering while waiting to enter or exit the field. Next slide, please. If you need to transport customers to the fields, make sure that your process is safe. So keep all household units six feet from others on the transportation. So if you have household, um, if everyone's from the same house, you can definitely put them together. If you have multiple people, you need to try and maintain that six feet worth of uh, distance in between. If you can, run more trips from the fields to keep the number of people riding lower. If you have parking options, making the parking lot closer to the field so people can walk with the household members, or give individuals the option to have a staff member deliver their produce to their vehicle. If it allows them to walk to their car rather than take the transportation, that would be ideal. Next slide, please. All right, cleaning and sanitizing at UPIC farms can be a bit challenging, but here are some tips that we have for you. As said before, make sure you use containers that are easy to clean or sanitize between customers. Don't let customers bring in their own containers uh, to avoid outside contamination. And also, again, you won't hear me say this enough, but clean frequently touched areas regularly and have lots of hand hygiene stations. Next slide. Okay, so for hay rack rides, wagon rides, train rides, all the rides that are fun at, at all of your types of facilities, um, follow these steps when possible. Again, like I mentioned earlier, seat household units alone. Um, this is especially important if your transportation does not allow for a six feet of distance between units and a unit is a family unit. unit. If you have a larger vehicle, just again, make sure the units are six feet apart. Arrange the seating to keep the social distancing between people. And you can consider loading back to front to get on and then when you offload, go from front to back so that everyone's going the same direction. And give, again, clear direction at the entrance and exit to keep people from congregating in crowds. Next slide. Face covering should be worn by all riders ages two and up who are able for the duration of the trip. So we hear lots about, I can't wear a face mask because I can't breathe. You can breathe, but some people have anxiety about it because they feel closed in and that's understandable, but they need to wear them as, unless they, it's medically not possible for them to wear. Set up hand sanitizing stations at drop off locations and have each person use it before continuing and make sure you're cleaning the handrails and the frequently touched surfaces. Next slide. Haunted houses and corn mazes. So if you're a facility with a haunted house or a corn maze, um, ensuring the safety of your staff and patrons hopefully can be done by these tips. Keep your staff in the same costume through the entire shift. Have them get dressed at home if possible and limit the groups of people in changing or dressing rooms. Make sure all the costumes, masks, anything that goes with it are cleaned after every shift or each night. Staff should wear a face covering at all times. A mask may substitute for a face covering, but only if it has at least two layers of breathable fabric that covers both the nose and the mouth and does not leave gaps around the face. Do not have staff wear both a cloth mask and a costume mask. That could inhibit breathing and become a dangerous situation rather quickly. Next slide, please. 
Make sure all your staff and patrons understand that the event is touch free and a one way activity. Have periodic places where people can actually leave if they want to stop participating in the ha haunted house or the maze, but so that they're not going back against the new traffic that's coming in. Do not use high touch props or decorations. Examples of these would be streamers or the plastic sheeting that people will put down in haunted houses that people have to walk through to get from room to room. And definitely please do not use candy bowls or other communal food of any kind. So you guys have probably seen online some of the ideas on how you get candy to trick or treaters. There's some pretty innovative ideas such as shooting it down like a PVC pipe that's been wrapped, things like that to keep the distance and so that you're the only one that's touching the candy, the wrapped candy. And be creative, that's totally fine. Consider switching to a drive through haunted trail where attendees remain in their vehicle. That would be fun. That would definitely take up a lot of room. All right, next slide. So I've, I've gone through all of our guidance. I do want to give credit where we stole it from um, because if you have been on our website, we do not have it posted yet. So this came from Minnesota, New York, Michigan, Washington, and of course the CDC. Um, the links, as you see, are in my presentation. I don't know if the presentation will be sent out or not, but if yes, they're saying yes. So it will be. So you will have all of the resources available to you, um, and I can answer any questions. So Ashley, um, the first question that we had asked was, once a person has had COVID, as has one of our employees and has recovered, are they immune? That's a great question, and that's one we get asked a lot. So right now, um, CDC is saying that potentially a person would be immune for about three months. So what we, what we have seen in doing antibody testing and such is that they have antibodies, and then we have seen them disappear within about the three-month time period. So we have not come out directly and said, hey, if you've had it, you're good for three months. You can do, you know, not worry about anything, but you, they should be safe for three months and they would not be able to shed the virus again. The only caveat to that is if they were to get a different strain, which we have not seen a lot of. So far, that's so, all the questions for right now, unless, uh, do you have one, Sue? Well, I was wondering, was there, is there an opportunity to open it up live to where if anybody has any questions? Um, is that capability there or just the chat or the Q&A? No one has raised hand or anything that they're wanting to ask a live one so far. Okay, so let's just keep on moving on then and um, Thank you, Ashley, very much. Uh, Ashley said she would stick around if she, uh, as long as she can. And uh, don't worry about your dog. I don't think I've been on a webinar yet that a delivery driver hasn't pulled up, and of course, then the dog goes off. And, and uh, my husband's actually out coyote hunting tonight, so I was hearing the sounds of uh, rabbits uh, through my window. So it happens. Okay. We're, we're yeah, and I was afraid that was going to happen. They were actually deer hunting, and I was hoping that they would get back <laughs> there so I'd have my my present myself on mute. So I thank yeah. you. Guys. No, no worries. Actually, um, we did just have Mike Hersey raise his hand. Okay. Uh, can we turn on Mike's mic? Yes. Mike Hersey, go ahead and ask your question. Mike Hersey, are you? Hello, you're on. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Huh? Yes, sir. We can hear you. Well, I, I don't have any questions right now. I'm just, I'm just wait, waiting to see what's next. Okay, all righty. Um, we'll go back to muting you. Uh, next, I'm going to uh, introduce Janelle Dobbins, who we've already seen with the Kansas Department of Agriculture. Janelle, would you tell us a little bit more about yourself and what you do for the Department of Ag? And uh, folks, remember to put any questions in the chat box or just like Mike did, you can raise your hand and we can unmute you and have you ask your question live. So Janelle, go ahead. Good evening, everybody. As Sue said, I'm Janelle Dobbins with the Kansas Department of Agriculture and I am the From the Land of Kansas Marketing Manager. So to give you a Quick little background on myself. I'm a born and raised Kansas farm girl from Northeast Kansas. 
uh, we have both, we had cattle, hogs, uh, row crops. We also did hay, so a little bit of everything. And I've been to many and many uh, pumpkin patch, apple picking, Christmas tree farm. And we also work with all of you guys as part of our From Land to Kansas program. So for the ones of you who aren't aware of our program, we are the state's trademark program. So we promote and celebrate agricultural experiences and products that are grown, raised, or produced in Kansas. Next slide. So that means we're working with farmers and ranchers, producers and processors, value added agriculture, agritourism, which is most of you guys watching tonight, manufacturing, restaurants, and retail partners. Next slide. So to be part of the From the Land of Kansas program, you have to have 100% of the product grown, raised, or produced in Kansas, or 100% of the products processing, manufacturing, or craftsmanship done in Kansas, or majority of all of you listening tonight, it's the business provides an agricultural base experience in Kansas. And to qualify to be part of our From the Land of Kansas program with that, you first actually work with Kansas Department of Wildlife, Parks, and Tourism and get registered with them, which you'll hear more about from Sue after I finish speaking. And additionally, we just always make sure all of our products and businesses are in good standing uh, with state, local, national regulatory authorities. Next slide. So some of the benefits of being part of the From the Land of Kansas program, and we have both free benefits and then paid benefits. So we offer marketing assistance, online promotions such as Facebook, and we even do Facebook Lives with some of our members, Twitter, Instagram, and on blogs. Also having use of the From the Land of Kansas logo, Discounted rates with the Kansas Value Added Foods Lab. So let's say you are wanting to start to make apple butter from your extra apples you have, and you're wanting to start selling that. So we could help you work directly with Kansas Value Added Foods Lab, get that all tested and licensed and ready to sell. We also have monthly newsletters, so both ones that go out to members, and then we also do consumer-facing ones. We do events and trade shows, and then we have our full benefit catalog online. But one of the big things that I don't have on here is also as a free member is you are listed on our website and we have a mapping feature. So folks could easily go in there this time of year and put on the map and see where all they might wanna go hit a couple of different pumpkin patches, apple picking or different things across the state and they can easily find you when you're listed as a member. Next slide. So how do you sign up for From the Land of Kansas? You first submit an application. So all you have to do is shoot us an email at From the Land of Kansas at ks.gov and we'll send you that application and then you get to select your benefits for the year. And we have them as a la carte. So you can select as many or as few, whatever really fits your business. And then just stay in touch because we're always doing new uh, events and opportunities out there to give you um, more information. And then we do renewal every January. And if you're not sure at any time if you're renewed or not, if you send us an email, we'll look that up for you and verify it. Next slide. And then for the ones of you who also might be selling at farmer's markets, you wanna make sure that your farmer's market is registered with us because we are the central farmer's market registration point. We have more than 76 registered markets of all sizes, all the way from Overland Park to Syracuse, but the registration provides limited legal liability, access to resources, marketing and promotions such as social media, farmer's market month. And once again, we also have that mapping feature and the list on our website, so it's a great way that consumers might find that market. And then you just have to remember that you have to renew every year. Next slide. But then there's a couple of overarching things also that the Kansas Department of Agricultural um, resources we have. So those are specialty crop block grants, organic certification cost share program, the ag stress assistance, and then guidance for agritourism. Next slide. So those first two, the specialty crop block grant program, um, in the past, we've done conference education support, and we just um, received affirmation that funds will be available this coming year, and we'll be releasing more specific details in the next week um, by an official KDA media release. So watch social media and our newsletters for more information on that. And then the organic cost share program just got announced that there is going to be a 50% um, eligible to be reimbursed certification process up to $500 per category. So if you got certified between October 1st, 2019 and September 30th, so just yesterday, 2020, um, make sure and get those applications in before the 15th of December and you would be eligible to get up to $500 per category. Next slide. 
And then on ag stress assistance, every once in a while, as we know, there's been a lot of things happening this year and it's been pretty stressful at times. So you can always go online at kansasagstress.org and it provides resources and support to those dealing with ag related stress. We partnered with K-State Research and Extension and other ag partners to grab this, to make this great resource. So just go online anytime and you can find both local and national resources. Next slide. And then as I mentioned, we have COVID-19 guidance for agritourism businesses on the KDA website. And so I'll actually put the link in the chat box here after my presentation. And also when we send out the video link, we'll also include it in there, but it has easy uh, written hints and things you should be making sure um, you're just aware of as you are open for the season. So any questions, next slide, that you have at any time, you can reach myself at chanel.dobbins at ks.gov or Sammy Gleason, who many of you know are also our marketing coordinator. Uh, you can call or email us and we are always happy to uh, get you more information. And even if you have questions for Ashley and you can't get to her or just have general questions about anything, give us a call. We will happy, happily work with um, any of our partners and make sure we can get those questions answered for you. Thank you, Janelle. Uh, and we will move on uh, right into my presentation. Uh, folks, you that are agritourism businesses, you probably either talked to me on the phone or I have sent an email letter to you or seen you out and about. Um, I really, really miss the State Fair this year where we got the opportunity always to be able to have agritourism businesses in our booth or see you uh, marketing your wares in the from the land of Kansas booth. So um, that's just been another thing that we've had to deal deal with with COVID. Uh, I too was born on a ra and raised on a farm in southeast Kansas, actually in Franklin County. Uh, we had row crops and cattle. Uh, we didn't have horses, uh, so we were the legs that moved the cows from pasture to pasture and there wasn't the use of herbicides, so we were also the hands that cut the cuckleburrs out of the fields because dad liked clean fields. So uh, I do know uh, quite a bit about agriculture and kind of, this is my dream job, working with rural Kansases and, uh, Kansans, uh, helping them diversify their farm operation. Um, and then I also manage a Kansas byways program for the Kansas Department of Wildlife, Parks and Tourism. So, we know that people are looking uh, more than ever for opportunities where they can get out of the house in a safe manner. Uh, and we want all of our Kansas agritourism businesses to provide a safe en environment for families to get out and enjoy. And certainly nobody wants to end up on uh, Ashley's boss's website as a cluster for an outbreak of COVID-19. So we hope that you're taking to heart many of the things that have been shared here tonight. Because I work for the Kansas Department of Tourism, of course, I get to share lots of nice pictures with you. So next slide. One of the things that we would like for you to do is to talk with your local county health department. Uh, Ashley said she used to work in the health department. Invite them out to your farm even before you opened, and I know a lot of you are already open, but uh, walk them through your activities. Show them, you know, let them make suggestions. Um, do whatever you can to make sure that when your employees are taking their breaks, just as Ashley said, don't let them congregate together in a break room. So this just shows um, one of the agritourism businesses that I came across that were emphasizing masks on their farm. We know each county in Kansas uh, follows different regulations. Uh, be sure again to check with your local health department if your county requires masks if people are out and about, uh, enforce that. Uh, you are the business owner. You can say whether you want masks worn on your property or not, but again, as we've seen, don't make a huge issue of it, and you want people to be welcoming. You want to be welcoming and your employees to be welcoming, um, but you also want to be safe. Uh, and above all, people are coming to the farm for that authentic Kansas experience. So, you know, how can we make them safe? And, and uh, share what you have with them. Next slide. 
one of the things I would suggest uh, is to document your cleaning practices, you know, write it down, uh, both for your employees references on how often you would like them to sanitize, make sure you are sanitizing heavily used areas. Uh, I've seen folks use a, a laminated guest, uh, a laminated card that the guests can flip when they finish eating at a table that says needs clean, so the staff knows that it needs to be clean, the staff can go sanitize it, and on the other side, the sign says that it's clean, so your guests know that that table has been sanitized and ready for them to sit down to eat their food and enjoy with their family. Uh, and here are some pictures of some of the signs that I got together, and uh, the one that shows that, you know, keep a cow distance apart, anything that you can do to keep that authenticity that goes along with your farm, your brand, uh, you can make all kinds of signs that I, I heard uh, Jay talking about a 150 pound pumpkin. That's that's got to be pretty wide, whether it's six feet or not, I'm not sure. But, you know, use your own uh, props to show what six feet, six feet distance is. Next slide. A lot of our businesses have gone to an online ticketing only. Uh, that you can uh, have your visitors, customers access. Now that would all need to be explained on your website for them to be able to see. And uh, it has gone well from what I've read. Um, I am part of a NAFTMA uh, farmers group online and many have shared it and said uh, they probably will never go back because it has helped with people complaining about long lines. They, uh, folks are scheduled have a time slot that they are supposed to arrive at the farm. And then, you know, others have even allowed some of those online tickets if they haven't sold out to where people can, that walk up, can still purchase the online tickets on their phone while they're waiting in line. But if you're sold out to your capacity, you're sold out, period. You just will have to turn turn away guests this year. And I know that everybody wants as many in as they, they can get, but it's just not the case this year. You wanna be able to know what the capacity of your farm is. Next slide. Okay, uh, when Ashley was talking about uh, people being able to go one direction or another, and a Christmas tree farm is a perfect opportunity that. Uh, folks can walk down one end of the row of the Christmas trees and then walk back up the other and just keep that uh, motion going uh, until uh, they find their perfect Christmas tree. Uh, mazes, are, lines are already set up. Uh, hopefully they will all keep going the same direction to find their way out. Uh, these pictures, Sunflower Patch, um, Eleanor's, uh, events is the sunflower patch and the uh, Christmas tree farm is from Lawrence at Prairie Elf Christmas tree farm and then Walter's pumpkin patch has this wonderful Chiefs Kingdom maze this year that uh, shows the line that folks are supposed to go to get in and out. Uh, you can meter the number of guests that are allowed in the tree in the mazes and places at one time. Next slide. So uh, Ashley was talking about hay rack rides. This was a picture that I saw of a hay rack ride where they actually put dividers in between spaces on the ride. They made them, them various sizes. It looks like some that maybe would fit a family of three or four and then a divider down the middle so that uh, folks could uh, ride the hay rack ride and still be safely kind of next to each other, like the plexiglass dividers that, that you have seen at checkouts. Uh, again, family units is a term. You want them to stay together as much as possible and distance themselves from other family units. Next slide. So one of the things I was thinking about as I prepared these slides is uh, Halloween's on a Saturday this year. Uh, I know some pumpkin patches are done and they're ready to be closed, but maybe that's a perfect opportunity to offer some other sort where people are not comfortable with their kids going out and uh, walking door to door and trick or treating. 
So some of the opportunities that you could do is to host a drive through haunt. Uh, I think Ashley again had mentioned this type of delivery method for the candy at the door. Uh, if you had that drive through haunt, I'm sure you could come up with a creative way to get the candy in the window of a car as they drive past or offer your farm up for a trunk or treat on the farm for your community. Um, you can space the cars out and uh, let folks be able to still enjoy uh, safe distancing trick-or-treating. Next slide. There are great opportunities to uh, have your some fun with the signs. I already said that. These are some that our marketing office came up with to uh, just have available for safe social distancing to promote it. Next slide. And with our beautiful Kansas skies, um, nighttime is a great time to extend your agritourism activities uh, with say a, uh, a campfire. Uh, you can do prepackaged s'more mixes, uh, package them up and have your campfires or fire pits spaced uh, adequate distance apart. I think I've seen, I don't know, I'm not very good with feet, but probably 15 feet apart at least, probably more than that. And just have several campfires in and around your farm. Sell those prepackaged s'more kits to your guests and let them enjoy the nighttime sky with plenty of space. Next slide. So I'm going to tell you a little bit uh, about the agritourism program with the state. Those are you that are already registered. Thank you for participating in the program. It is a free program to all. Once you are uh, registered and approved, this is a certificate that you would receive. The certificates are good for five years and they're good from the date of issuance. So the date of issuance is there underneath the agritourism registration certificate. I assign you a number, the email when you register comes right into my e email or inbox and um, the applications are all re reviewed and they are either approved or denied. Agritourism is about the experience that you provide the farmers on your farm, um, be it fishing, hunting, kayaking, pumpkin patches, Christmas tree farms. Uh, we have just a huge variety, lavender farms, uh, bed and breakfasts on the farm, things like that. So the, the range is huge. We have over 400 registered agritourism businesses in Kansas. So we would love to have you join us if you are not registered. Again, it is free to do. Uh, next slide. This is the agritourism morning sign. That certificate that I had on the last slide and this sign together posted on your farm, the agritourism morning sign posted on your farm in full view for your visitors to see, provide you with a layer of limited liability protection so that anybody that comes to your farm is taking into their hands the liability that are uh, liability risks that are inherent on an agritourism farm. So you have to have this agritourism sign posted as well as a current and active certificate to be covered under that layer of liability protection. Next slide, please. And you may register at www.kansasagritourism.com. Be sure to list all of the activities on your farm. And when I say all, if you have slides, say slides. If you have a maze, say a maze. If you have, if you host weddings, say weddings. It, I want to have everything listed that guests can enjoy on your farm because if someone gets hurt, they're going to look and see what you were registered for protection for. Uh, again, that agritourism registration, uh, it just needs that, that information. You have an opportunity also to uh, fill in kind of your 30 second elevator speech to say, this is what's going to happen on your farm. Welcome. These are the things that you'll enjoy. And then I like to get some pictures available to be able to put with your listing on the travelks.com website. I also market the agritourism businesses on the Kansas Agritourism Facebook page. Uh, if you share your events with me, I will share them online. Uh, so be sure to get those into me if you can. 
Otherwise, I'm searching Facebook to see what you all are doing and try to share information with the folks. Next slide, please. Oh, and that, that picture is from Little Munchkin's Pumpkin Patch and Farm Activities at Alma. This is my contact information. Uh, you can give me a call anytime if you have questions. We also have a new agritourism manual. It's not new anymore, but we do have an agritourism manual. Uh, I am mailing them out to folks uh, on the registered farms when I send out the certificate, or you can look at it on, at issue.com, I-S-S-U-U.com on the Kansas Department of Wildlife, Parks and Tourism issue page, and you can flip through it and see it there if you wanna read it online. Next slide, please. And then the last thing, be sure to thank your guests for coming out, especially years like this. Um, it, it is, uh, with kids back in school, I don't think it's as scary as it was for people to let loose of their kids and, and send them to the farm. And we know you're not babysitters and we hope that they keep them uh, contained when they uh, come to your farm. Uh, but thank them for coming out and enjoying the space that you have created for them and their family on their, on, on your and just so you can all see i put in um the chat box the social distancing signs link there's uh, six different ones that tourism have created there's ones with sunflowers and different things so feel free to um, grab any of those that you might want to use and right now it doesn't look like we have any new questions or anything so we are going to turn it over to jay schwinn uh, who is the manager at Walter's Pumpkin Patch, Burns, and the Agritourism Advisory Committee Chair. So Jay, give us a little background and tell us about what you guys have been up to at the Pumpkin Patch so far this year. Okay, well thank you very much for having me tonight. Uh, I grew up in northeastern Kansas uh, on a small little farm up there. Uh, we did a lot of vegetables, farmers markets, things like that. My dad was actually a carpenter, uh, so it was my brother and I that did a lot of the, the gardening uh, and, and started farmer started going to farmers markets and things like that. I moved off the farm then and went to Colorado, where I went to work for Merrill Lynch. Uh, I actually worked for Merrill Lynch for about 15 years on the East Coast, uh, Indiana, uh, and then moved back to Kansas uh, after the market crash of 2008. Um, I helped my little brother then uh, kind of grow his agri agritourism business a little bit. Once we got at that off the ground, uh, it was kind of time for me to move on. And so I was given the opportunity to come down to Burns and manage Walter's Pumpkin Patch, which has been actually a, a great experience. Um, this is my second year down here. Um, first year went great. Second year is going very well, uh, you know, amid COVID and everything else. Uh, Sue asked me to talk a little bit about some of the things we were doing this year that maybe are a little different or uh, that we've done to, to help protect ourselves and our guests. And we started talking about this early summer, of course, um, even from conversations of, are we even gonna be able to open? So uh, when the time rolled around and it looked like we were gonna be open, we were actually very happy uh, that we, we were gonna have the opportunity to, to even open up. Uh, we had a little dry run with our Sunflower Festival that we did in August. Um, it's never, it, this is just the second year they've done that. So it, it's not a real big event, but we knew we would have some customers. Uh, we advertised it just like we did last year. We asked guests to wear, wear masks in buildings, but not necessarily, they didn't have to wear them outside if they didn't want to, but we did ask them to wear a mask if they were interacting with any staff. Um, that actually worked pretty good. Uh, it being an outdoor event, uh, social distancing wasn't a problem. Our fun park is actually about 10 or 12 acres, so we can really spread people out there. We can, we can handle a lot of people and keep them far away. Uh, we have about 30 acres of pumpkins, so again, even on the, in the pumpkin patch, we can spread people out. We do have two stores um, that people can go into and shop, of course, but uh, the, the, the Sunflower Festival was a, was a great dry run for us just to see how things were gonna go. When we got into the full season, which we are only open six weeks a year, uh, we open the second or third week of September through October. Um, so we, we have to get people in here. Uh, we have to get them to stay. 
so they spend more money. And so that, that creates a huge challenge, especially in the environment that we're in this year. Uh, what we did do is we, we re do require all of our employees to wear masks. Uh, we also, uh, we kind of took the approach this year of respect, concern, and no fear. Um, respect being respect for the employees, respect being for our guests. Um, so wearing masks, um, making sure that we're requesting that they wear a mask. Um, the concern, of course, the concern of the virus, uh, the concern of, you know, it, we started out with the concern of how do you make people wear a mask? And the short answer is you can't. Um, if they want to wear a mask, they're going to wear a mask. If, if they don't want to wear a mask, they're not going to. Um, it's even harder to make people wear a mask when there's no law that says you have to wear a mask. Uh, so basically, we just request and suggest that they wear a mask when they're in the buildings or interacting with employees. Um, we do have masks available when they come in the building as well as uh, sanitation stations and things like that. Um, and we have, we've had no problems, really. Um, some people wear masks, some people don't. The no fear thing was we really just didn't want to be working all season that we were open fearing coronavirus. So we took what we felt were common sense approaches. Um, we were hearing of people that were not opening their corn mazes because they couldn't be sanitized. Um, they weren't opening their jumping pillows because they couldn't be sanitized. To us, that, I, I mean, that just doesn't make sense um, for several different reasons. One, you can sanitize a jumping pillow. Um, we have people that go around and they sanitize the pillows like every hour with a, with a pump-up sprayer. Um, and sanitizer. We just ask people to get off for, for an hour. We spray it down. They can go back to jumping. Uh, the corn pit or the corn barn, um, yeah, it's hard to sanitize corn. But again, um, I, I don't know that we're going to have a lot of corona from, from corn. Most of the people that are in the corn bin or the corn barn are small kids, younger children, uh, not quite as susceptible we just didn't see it as a, as a huge thing to, to shut that down. Um, our wagon rides, we can get, we run two wagons most of the time. We sometimes have to run three and sometimes have to run four. We get about 30 people on three of the wagons and probably 20, 25 on the fourth wagon. Um, we do, we haven't had a problem yet this year. We've only been open a couple of weekends. We haven't had a problem with super big crowds. But what we are doing is we're just running wagons constantly. So once somebody gets on a wagon, uh, we take that group, we drop them off in the pumpkin patch, and that wagon goes back empty and picks up the next group and brings them in, drops them off in the pumpkin patch. We actually have uh, one, two, three. We have three pumpkin patch, three fields um, of pumpkins this year, plus our giant patch. Um, so we can move people. Uh, to those different patches so we don't have big crowds in any of the patches. Um, it seems to be working well. Um, they'll drop a load off and then they'll pick up people if they're ready to come back. Uh, it keeps the lines down. Uh, people don't mind waiting in a pumpkin patch and they don't have to wait all in one area. The wagon will, will just drive the path and pick people up wherever they are. So that seems to be working well. Um, as far as our, our other activities, um, again, being on 10 or 12 acres, we don't have a lot of problem with people just jamming up at one spot. We do go around and sanitize stuff. Uh, we bought a lot of those, a lot of sprayers, hand pump up sprayers. Um, and we, we have some of the help go around and, and they spray the swings, they spray the slides, they, um, wherever kids are playing, they spray those occasionally. Um, the maintenance guys do that a lot. The biggest thing we did this year is we closed on Mondays and Tuesdays. Um, once we opened in the past, we had been open every day uh, for our season. We decided this year to close on Mondays and Tuesdays because Saturdays and Sundays are our busiest days. And that gives us a day to really clean everything really well and sanitize everything really well and just give everything a rest period. Um, you know, I, like I said, I grew up on a farm um, and I helped my cousins farm a lot. And 
we always figured that one of the best disinfectants was, was sunshine and hopefully we have some bright sunny days, you know, and, and that helps us the jumping pillows and some of the outdoor playground equipment and things like that. Uh, like I say, so far we've had no issues. Um, the biggest problem that we have had in dealing with are kids that are in school that work for us that have been exposed to COVID and then go on a 14 day mandatory uh, lockdown and then we are short employees. So we've had to hire some extra employees this year just to make up some of the difference. Uh, that's, been, that's been one of the challenges that we've had. Uh, other than that, like I say, everything has gone smooth. Uh, unfortunately, our pumpkin patches are about half a mile or so from our parking lot. So we don't really have the opportunity to just let people park and walk to the pumpkin patch and, and get their pumpkins. It's almost always a wagon ride to the pumpkin patch. Um, the giant pumpkin patch, same way. Uh, we, we have employees that help people get their big pumpkins. Um, we do not have a petting zoo. Uh, I saw a question just pop up about that. We have goats that people can buy the goat feed and run it up a conveyor to feed the goats, but uh, we don't have any, any petting zoos. I would think that a petting zoo, you know, I would manage it pretty much the same way. I don't, you know, animals aren't transmitting COVID, so you know, your, your safety there is about the same thing as, as what you would normally be doing. Um, other than that, the corn maze, uh, people go in the corn maze, they come out of the corn maze. There is a distinct entrance and exit to the corn maze, uh, but that doesn't mean that when people get in the corn maze, they all walk the same path in the same direction. I'm sure they're crossing. Um, and again, the paths are wide. Uh, they're, may not, they're probably not they're probably, they're five feet wide. So not quite six feet, but people could pass at a reasonable distance there. Um, like I say, so far, so good. Um, we are a concern just like everybody else. Uh, Butler County doesn't really have some, some tight restrictions on um, what capacities are, what we can do. A lot of agritourism farms have asked the question, though, if your county says you can be at 50% capacity, what's your capacity? I think that's a great question. Um, like I say, our fun park is 10 acres, our pumpkin patch is uh, uh, 30, our corn maze is five. Uh, so, you know, we've got a lot of acres that we can spread people out on. Um, I, I don't know what our capacity would be. It would be a lot, um, especially, um, you know, Business has got to run. Uh, we try to make all our money in six weeks. We're going to do everything we can to get our customers here, keep our customers safe. We have seven windows that people can check in on when they get here. We have online tickets that we offer that we have a separate window for online tickets. We have three concession stands that we've moved things around in those so that people aren't always lined up at the same concession stand for something that just that concession stand has. Um, so again, I think it's a common sense approach, um, to think that you're going to shut a business down, um, I think is ludicrous personally. Um, there's some people that are going to wear a mask and be very content with it. There's other people that aren't, and they're going to be content with that. And I think we just have to be able to respect everybody in the direction that they want to go and do everything we can to keep people safe with hand cleaning stations where we need them, uh, even where we don't need them, but just so people can walk by and use them, sanitizing things as, as often as possible, and, uh, you know, doing everything we can to keep people spread out as far as possible. Jay, are you guys doing any temperature checks, or what are you asking of your employees to make we sure? Do, we, do, we do temperature checks when employees come in to the employees. Um, we don't temperature check every guest that comes in. No. <laughs> uh, we, we felt that that would just make more of a line. So we don't do that. But the employees, we do temperature check them. Um, really, I mean, the schools that have done such a job with the, with the kids, uh, you know, if they're, if they're not quarantined because of COVID, they're probably safe because they're being checked out so much at the, at the schools. Um, school tours is something, though, that's big for us. We do a lot of school tours a year. They're way down. Uh, most of the school tours that we're doing now are home schools. Uh, but we've had some very large groups of homeschools come in. Um, we've even had bus loads of kids come in, believe it or not, which I didn't think we'd see any buses of kids, but we have had bus loads. When they come in, um, 
it's pretty much business as usual with them. If they're all on the same bus, we figure they're the same group. So if it takes two wagons, uh, we get them on two wagons, we get them on two wagons. If we get them all on one wagon, we get them on one wagon. Um, and they go to the pumpkin patch, pick their pumpkins, uh, play the rest of the day. Uh, we clean everything up just like on the, on the weekends when they're here. Um, we don't have near as many school tours as we've had in the past, but we, we are still getting some, which I'm actually surprised. Thank you, Jay. Go ahead, Janelle. Um, so there was a question. Have you had any schools request a virtual tour of the pumpkin patch and then to like pick up and to have pumpkins dropped off or doing it kind of in a different way this year? We have not had that request. I do know of a farm that's doing that. Um, they actually did a video of basically the, the walkthrough tour that they normally did with the students. Uh, and then they are, are offering uh, the school either to come pick up pumpkins or to have them delivered. Um, we have not, we haven't done anything like that. I like the idea because I think it's something that uh, even after COVID, it's probably something that uh, we could offer to schools. It also opens your market up too, right? I mean, if they can do it virtually, you're not just, uh, you know, just locked into an hour, hour and a half, two hours away from your farm. You can go a lot further away. S so I know that I shared on Facebook a uh, virtual tour that uh, a farm down in Southeast Kansas that went ahead and closed or they retired this year, but she was a school teacher in a former life. And you can go onto the Kansas Agritours on Facebook page and she explains the process of how pumpkins grow. Uh, so uh, Janelle, did you have some other questions? Yes. I had, yep, I had some pop up here. So, um, Ashley, I think this would be for you. The question is, what do I do if our local health department comes to our place of business and we have everything posted and we're doing our best, yet some of our guests do not comply? Turn on your mic, Ashley. All right, here I am. Can you hear me now? Yes. So, that's a really great question. Um, if your guests don't comply, there's not a lot that you can do, unfortunately. I guess it depends on how strict you want to be with your guests. Um, and of course, the easy answer is ask them to leave if they're not going to comply with your requirements, such as wearing a mask, social distancing, things like that. Um, I would suggest that you pick your battles um, because this is, as you guys are very well aware, it's very, COVID has become very political and um, has not made this job easy for anyone to including you guys. So again, like I said, pick your battles. If you can keep an eye on them, their social distancing and staying away from everyone, I would probably let them just go about their business. Um, and the health department, I, I can't imagine, there's so many fish to fry right now for the workers of the local health departments. I don't think that they're going to create an issue for you other than maybe offer a suggestion or something. The good thing is with most of you, your business is outside. Um, and so it is a bit safer than being inside. Okay, excellent. And then the next question is, what happens if we are connected to an outbreak? Is there someone at the state level that can help us? Yes, of course. So if you're connected to an outbreak, um, the main people who will help you would be your local health department. So um, you can always, your local health department will probably be the one to contact you once they start associating cases um, back to your facility. Um, if you, you can always reach out to the local health department if you think that there is the potential of an outbreak or you have heard that there is a positive. I know in some of the smaller communities, that's people know people better than others. Um, but also, if you have questions about an outbreak or what to do, if you're trying to be proactive and you know that there's a positive that's going to come back to you, you can always call our Epi hotline. And that number is on our website. Um, um, on our KDHE website for the Epi hotline, and I can always send it to Sue or Janelle, either one, so you can put it out. But that we enter that number 24 7, 365. So I, please don't call and just ask, hey, what's the status on something? But call it if you have if you have a concern or you're worried about an outbreak of any kind. And of course, um, Janelle and Sue both have my email. I can get you my contact information to my assistant so I can easily be found and answer any questions too for you. 
Okay, that's all the questions so far, Sue, we've gotten. Okay, if we could open it up, if anybody has a live question that they'd like to ask, um, we'll give about 30 seconds for you to come live. Uh, again, all you have to do, um, I think, is unmute your mic. Janelle, do you know, is that correct, that they just unmute their mic? Raise their hand. Raise your hand is what you need to do. Um, Hey, Sue, while we're waiting, I just want to kind of reiterate what Ashley said, too. I think it's uh, if you have somebody come to your farm that isn't going to comply with your rules, you, you really do have to pick your battles because it's, I mean, it's some people are just, I mean, borderline crazy with this thing as far as, you know, I'm not going to wear a mask. I'm not going to, wear, you know, and if they're that way you're better off just to let it go and let them not wear a mask and keep an eye on them and just make sure they're not being stupid around other people. And if that becomes a problem, then you have to say something. Fortunately for us, we haven't seen that, but we, I mean, we don't even, we'll request that people wear a mask. If they come in without a mask, we'll tell them we have them available. Um, and if some, you know, you'll get the thing, I'm not wearing no damn mask. Well, okay, then that's fine. Don't wear a mask, you know, but, I think that's, I think that was great advice to just say, you know, pick your battles and, and just do everything you can. The, the key is to, I mean, your employees are important, you're important people too. So you want to make sure that they're wearing the mask that's protecting them and protecting, and it, protecting the, uh, your customers too. Okay, Mike, I see you have a question. You are unmuted, so you should be able to ask it. Okay, well, this has been going on for since March or something like that. Well, the first three months, I, I just want to share this, okay? The first three months, I am sure that I hooked up 150 purchasers, customers to different farmers in our area. And I know two of, two of our meat farmers sold out. I mean, they just didn't have any more meat. And, and this is what we're doing at Casa Somerset. And right now we, we just started a new Facebook page last Friday and it is Miami County Farmers and uh, Marketplace. So we're letting far, uh, farmers set up here to sell their goods. It was just on Sunday. Now this next weekend is going to be Saturday and Sunday, but they're getting the extra sales. But I'm going to say 25, 30 years ago, a guy wrote a story, this Kevin Gray in the Payola paper. Uh, at one time in Pale, I'm saying the 50s, there was 27 grocery stores. So in our county, and this is what I'm trying to push to our people, we could have 40 grocery stores out on farms so you don't drive into the city. So the farmers can sell their stuff and still make money. If people would work together, I must say I have two goat farmers, one on the east side and one on the west side of my county, if they both would take in products from the different farmers and sell it, that, that would save those farmers from going broke. And we have so many young farmers, I'm talking people under 40, you know, when the average farmer is 65 years old in the country, we have so many farmers in our agritourism area here that are like under 40. So we're working on that. With that. So I guess that's, I think we just need to look at things a little bit different. And how do we get business to these farmers so they survive, okay? or prosper for sure. So anyway, that's my talk for tonight. Sure, Th thank you, Mike, I really appreciate that. One of the things that uh, just came to reality for us uh, is, you know, we've known for a long time that our locker plants are super, super busy. And uh, Ashley said, you said your husband was out deer hunting. Uh, I've processed a deer all the way through to packaging, but my husband hasn't and uh, we don't have the tools to do that. And we've always taken ours to the locker plant and there are no locker plants around us receiving deer. So I see we have another question, Janelle. Actually, we have two. The first one, um, Jay, are you guys doing any special senior hours? We are not. Um... 
I don't know for our for our business that it would benefit us that much because we are so I mean we're we're a lot more so family and young person oriented than we are senior oriented. Um, we could definitely do that. We did have a book club come out uh, actually before we opened. It was a week before we opened. A book club came out uh, and had their uh, their meeting out here. We gave them a, a wagon ride and things like that. Uh, all elderly ladies, all wore masks, um, all came in separate cars, uh, were very comfortable together. They've continued to have their meetings through COVID. So um, we could do something like that, but, but we are not. Uh, again, our business model, I don't know that it would really fit real well. Okay, and then the next one is for Ashley, I think. Is there any known commercially available technology to install in your retail store's HVAC system to kill or filter out coronavirus so you can have people inside during the winter months? That is a ter terrific question. So, and, I, and unfortunately, I'm not gonna be able to give you a solid answer. I will tell you what I do know. So in, there's UV lights that are available that hospital settings have been using to sterilize rooms. Um, I think that if you Google those um, UV lights, and now I, if you Google it and associate it to COVID, you'll get lots of things popping up. But you really need to do your research on it to make sure they're appropriate. I can certainly take that question back um, and see what else has been found out. I know early on in the State Emergency Operations Center, we were researching it as well. Um, to see if we can maybe manufacture something or hire a, someone to manufacture something that we could send out across the state. Um, but I also know that um, there, there are certain mists that can go out that you um, basically, I'm trying to remember the type of machine it's in, but it's an aerosol, aerosolizing machine that you put a cleaning, uh, cleaning solution in and then it will aerosolize and it, and it cleans the room as well. Those are more, again, like for a healthcare setting. And for you guys, I don't know if, I, I don't, they're pricey. And so I don't know if it would be worth the spend for you, um, given that you guys are seasonal. I'm not trying to discourage you. I just would hate to see you spend the money on it to only use it if, you know, for a month out of the year or whatever, um, versus actually just having to really clean every evening or every morning like you do. Okay, well, it looks like um, we have answered. Uh, well, no, here's one more that came in and we'll give everyone about 30 more seconds after this one um, before we end for the evening. If COVID is transmitted by droplets, how long do the germs and those droplets survive when landing on a given surface? There's been mixed information about that um, early on that it was thought that, that the virus can live for several hours, several days on a, on a, on a countertop or, or whatever, something other than a human. Um, and it has now since been, that's kind of been recalled back in that the virus cannot survive as long on substances. So there's no firm answer yet because again this is still a new virus that they're still studying and so I haven't seen where they have actually said okay five minutes and you're out. Um, what we suggest is that's why you suggest wiping surfaces frequently. Now um, the frequently touched surfaces things like that that's why we really encourage masks to be worn because as I think everyone has kind of spoken one way or another in their presentation this evening masks are protecting um, the other person from you if you're wearing your mask and when you have droplets which is so common this time of the year from sneezing whether it's allergies to cold unfortunately influenza is coming up or covid droplets of your facilities okay and it looks like the very last question this may be more of a jay or sue one is other than we were, you know, talking about doing a virtual pumpkin patch tour, um, what other like kind of new and unique things have you, are you either doing on your own place or have you heard about other pl places doing for apple picking pumpkins, any of that that we would want to share with the group here before we wrap it up? I, I do know of some places that are doing drive through almost like drive through pumpkin patches. Um, we actually were thinking about that if we were going to, if we weren't going to be able to open up, 
because uh, of course you plant your pumpkins in June. If you have a pumpkin crop, you got to do something with it. So um, I do know some people that have done something kind of like that a uh, di couple different ways. One farm actually had them drive to the pumpkin patch and they had made paths through the pumpkin patch where they could drive out, stop their car, get out, pick a pumpkin. Um, they drove, they sold them by size and not by weight. So as they drove out to check out, um, the people could just basically look in the car and say, okay, that, was, that pumpkin is so many dollars or that's, it's that size. Um, other places I know of where they have actually picked the pumpkins and had them out and people just drive by, <clears throat> excuse me, and they will drive by the pile of pumpkins that they want and, and say, hey, I want one of those. And, and they were priced accordingly that way. So those are some things I've seen on the, on the pumpkin patch side. I haven't heard a lot of the apple um, on the apple side, but some people have done there, but I don't, I do know some pumpkin patches that have, have gone to more of a drive through thing. I know I have read with some of the UPIC that they uh, assign people to a specific area or a specific tree uh you know by uh marking it off and saying this is where you can go pick uh some of the fun things that i have seen people do with having people come to their farm uh is just to put up a big screen and have drive-in movies from their parking lot uh, and that's been successful for some of the farms across the u.s this summer you know, I know we're getting on in time, folks. Um, Janelle, are there any more questions? We will do our best to get them all, but I don't want to keep anybody longer um, than we have to tonight. I think we've had some real good questions and uh, excellent participation, and most folks are still hanging on that started out with us. Uh, any, any of the panelists have any last things to say? Uh, I would say wear your mask. <laughs> I, I am a mask wearer, uh, and, um, I've been fortunate to be able to work at home a lot this year, so you have not seen me out and about. But uh, wear your masks and and please be safe out there. And thank you again to all the other panelists. Any final I'll, I'll say from a from the mask thing, I personally have found that wearing a neck gaiter is much simpler than wearing a mask as far as taking it on and off. Um, and these last couple of days, um, I actually still live in Leavenworth and I work in Burns, which is a two and a half hour drive. Uh, I stay down here during the week and go home on the weekends uh, or during this time of year. Sometimes I don't even make it home during, during our off days. But uh, I like the neck gaiter because I could just pull it up real quick. Um, the, last, the last few days I've been wearing it, uh, even when I'm driving the tractor, just because it's been cool enough and windy enough. My lips have got horribly windburned and I forgot to bring any Carmex with me and I haven't made it to town. So um, look at a neck gaiter if the mask bothers you. Than and and I've heard, I've heard people say, and it keeps your nose warm when it's cold outside. Make sure your gator is double layered. So yeah, I would just say as a reminder, you know, if you guys have questions and you're not being able to find answers, uh, reach out to Sue or reach out to me. Um, so wildlife parks and tourism or from the land of Kansas and we'll get a hold of Ashley or Jay or whoever might be able to answer those questions for you and because um, one we want to make sure if you can be open this season we want you to be open because there's lots of folks looking for good outdoor activities so thanks again um, to all of our panelists and to all of you joining us tonight and um, We'll look forward to going out and uh, picking some pumpkins, apples, and eventually uh, getting those Christmas trees. So have a good evening, folks. Bye.